So without further, further ado, I would like to give a floor to Ketty, and we would like to keep it slightly informal. Uh, today's evening, we will first uh, have a lecture of Ketty for about 50 minutes to one hour, during which we will converse every now and then, and then we'll have a time, about half an hour, for your questions, which we hope will be many. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us, and Ketty. Uh, thank you. Is it different now? Okay. Uh, thanks everybody for being here and thanks uh, Pushkin House for uh, inviting me. Um, I chose this theme to talk today uh, because recently there have been so many discussions at conferences and other venues um, about completely failed modernity as the result of so many catastrophic events that we are surrounded with, that I wanted to revisit this notion uh, with all its satellites, um, modernity, so what are uh, controversies and incompatibilities that I find um, in post-decolonial or uh, post-modernist interpretation of this uh, notion. Um, and uh, um, what made me decide so is that uh, I was questioning whether when we say that these notions and its satellites, modernity and its satellite concepts such like universalism, the universal, culture, reason, something that we defy and dismiss uh, uh, lately, as the Western instrumental tools which had been used for colonial expansion, to what extent we can use them uh, ontically and ontologically. So to what extent their abuse that we come across in real politics can be the same that was meant uh, for these notions as their ontology, as their teleology, as their goal, uh, which some time ago was posited as their emancipatory potential. So um, I will start and uh, enumerate uh, the first kit, uh, epistemological kit, uh, where I will name the stereotypical interpretation and then some kind of contradiction to this interpretation. Yeah, so this will be the notions that we will go through uh, today. Uh, and uh, this is the first mm, contradiction. Modernity, which is associated with Western history and colonial conquests mainly, uh, but at the same time, we come across numerous non-Western modernities, and one such case about which I will be talking tomorrow during the workshop is the Greco-Arab translation movement, which actually created European modernity, um, as the poetry of Languedoc, as for instance, Georgian Renaissance, with its translation of uh, antique philosophy, Plato and Aristotle. Second, critique of modernity goes parallel with the critique of reason and rationality. And in this case, reason, humanism, rationality stand for Western, white, colonial context, whereas non-white, decolonial areas stand for sensuality and non-human subjectivities. But uh, again, the contradiction is that um, development of science in minor Asia uh, for instance, polyphonic system in Caucasia, they confirm that rationality, science, reason, and even dialectics were, conf were not confined to the West. And third um, contradiction, uh, modernity is associated, of course, with universalism, which we interpret as a colonial form of expansion and colonial tool to unite uh, regions uh, where we neutralize and lubricate their particularities and regard culture likewise. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, whatever epos we take uh, in it, um, 
creation or birth of its land, language, origin of the world is always associated with um, with the body, its de death and life uh, within the universe and as the universal event. Uh, another issue which is not so um, not so flat is that modernity itself is not a monolithic concept. It can be divided into modernity, modernization and modernism. And uh, modernity implies the shift from clerical theocratic condition to secular condition, to enlightenment, to post-feudal condition crowned by bourgeois revolutions and in that case all bourgeois revolutions are part and parcel and acquisition of such modernity including Marx's uh, philosophy and his analysis of capital. Modernization is a more instrumental tool which defines technocratic and technical uh, amelioration and improvement and development. And last, modernism uh, is um, a radical artistic tendency which rather often goes counter to modernity and counter to enlightenment. So modernism itself as the Western episteme and edifice revolutionized history of art and culture to the extent that it created the negative direction to discard the failed emancipatory projections and the failed project of um, uh, enlightenment. That is to say that the critique of modernity and enlightenment often emerged not necessarily from post or decolonial critique but also from the crisis of the Western theoretic edifices and in that sense the non-Western and Western sources of such critique overlap. And by the end of the lecture I will be trying to compare what is the difference between modernist or radical avant-garde critique of enlightenment and culture, universal culture, Western culture as such, and the decolonial and postcolonial uh, ones. Uh, now uh, I will simply be going uh, through um, the satellite notions uh, and uh, as you saw I will dwell on enlightenment, reason, universal and culture. And according to stereotypical interpretations, modernity and reason are grounded in rationality, as we know. But our question today would be whether, as I mentioned, factual, ontic application of these terms, such like universal, culture, reason, coincides with their epistemology and ontology. And this is the question that Chantal Mouffe poses when she tries to juxtapose politics as the rough, ontic, real political application and the political as the realm of agonistic imaginary which has a broader and more common ontological dimension. So. My take, uh, to start from the very beginning, is whether we can split these notions which had been so much degraded and devaluated uh, to find um, different dimensions of their application. I will start with deconstructing enlightenment and concept and no one would be a better reference here than Adorno and his Dialectics of Enlightenment and uh, what is his uh, incredible achievement and discovery here is that disenchantment of myth that opens up the path to the subject of modernity and reason as against the mystical soul do not in fact reside in the realm of reason but rather in the realm of instrumentalized ratiocination. So what we defy as enlightenment has never been true reason, true philosophic reason that should serve common good, but it has been nothing but instrumental ratiocination and already Hegel says, Hegel says that um, about um, enlightenment. Uh, such mode of rationality has nothing to do with thought. In addition to this, another discovery, even more important one, by Adorno and Horkheimer is that 
When we apply ritualistic, religious, uh, or occult efforts and think that they are enchantment as against rationality, Western rationality, we are mistaken here because, according to Adorno, both positivist rationality of bourgeois contemporaneity as well as occult efforts or religious practices, they rely both and reside on the same mechanistic combinatorics and nominalist treatment, um, nominalist mechanic, mechanic treatment of their mystic nature. So the mythical realm already presupposes the cunning rational individual who simply obeys divine rules formally while simultaneously invents means of violating or evading their divine power. And if you read this piece by Adorno, you remember that he gives example of Odysseus, who is passing by the Syrians at the same time, and simultaneously he obeys the rule of the divine, but cunningly and rationally saves himself. Um, but even uh, if you look at... Um, witchcraft, for example, and go to fairy tales, uh, we can remember that it also consists of certain formulas, of combinations, of mechanistic repetition, and in that sense, it's not far from mechanistic rationality. Thus, it is therefore an illusion that in myth, in ritual or religion, there is an anthropologically different and more spiritualized form of speculation exceeding rationality. Just as we see expulsion of thought in magical practices exerted in favor of mere combinatorics, we see the same expulsion and dismissal of thought in bourgeois reasoning pretending to be progressive and enlightenment, enlightened. And the same concerns the rationalism of industrial capitalist society and production. And in that sense, according to Adorno in this book, enlightened, enlightenment has never realized itself. So it even doesn't make sense to criticize it because it has never happened. And Katie, in a way, the, uh, uh, the modernism as a project was... was in itself, um, an anti-modernity movement in that sense, right? The the avant-garde's yeah. and the uh, the reaction to the uh, um, to the broken promise yeah. of enlightenment in a Absolutely. way was a disappointment that was expressed artistically in that sense, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, it was uh, the um, despair out of failed uh, project of emancipation of bourgeois revolutions of uh, expansion of common good and the project of the common good, and therefore the negative and uncanny um, retrieve of uh, the sociality of art into the radical negative practices, but we shall dwell on it. Uh, now I move to reason and treatment of reason, uh, comparing decolonial uh, approach to it, and maybe mm, what we have from Hegel and um, Derrida's interpretation of um, Cogito. Uh, well, again, this is another notion and another concept that is explicitly uh, interpreted as mm, some sort of instrumental, determinate rationality, uh, mathematical reason necessarily, uh, and um, something that cannot cover um, sensuous experience or the experience coming from the global south or some uh, types of poetry uh, that come from um, certain areas. So it's some sort of Western trans transparency that will never encompass in itself um, deviating experiences in poetry and art. However, um, Achille Mbembe himself, in his critique of black reason, claims that retroactive derangement of modernity to speak from the imaginary place 
in which modernity failures. And despite this failure of modernity, despite its coercion even, it is impossible that modernity be reversible. Modernity is not reversible, as Achille Mbembe insists. Therefore, emancipation from oppression stems from where the subject or community already is. So unlike uh, numerous um, thinkers like Sylvia Winter, for instance, or Denis Ferreira da Silva, he insists on this necessity that we start from the modernity condition without its reversibility. And he says, it is simply to remind us of an immediate and unavoidable fact, one whose origins lie in the beginnings of modern times. That the processes of mixing and interlacing cultures, peoples, nations are irreversible. There is therefore only one world, this is quite Badiusian what he says and in, unexpected for a decolonial thinker. There is therefore only one world, at least for now, and that world is all there is. What we all therefore have in common is the feeling of desire that each of us must be a full human being. The desire for the fullness of humanity is something that we all share. To build a world that we share, we must restore the humanity stolen from those who have historically been subjected to processes of abstraction and objectification. Um, and yet another example, when we apply a notion ontically, real politically, factually, uh, disregarding its epistemological, ontological application is the way philosophic reason is often treated in decolonial critique. So again, uh, this division into the ontic, real, factual treatment, like in real politics. In real politics, politics might be vicious, but it doesn't mean that we do not have to deal with the political. And in that case, we are realizing the ontological or the potential opportunity of the political to realize itself in the emancipatory uh, context. And um, I will be relying uh, and referring to F Denise Ferreira da Silva's arguments, uh, where she countered to um, Achille Bembe claims that continental philosophic reason operates as separation and determinacy, founding its speculation on mathematical units and values, that is, on formalizing conditions of thinking. Uh, and he rebukes Marx for his theory of value because, as she argues, slave labor cannot create surplus value a la Marx as it has not been counted and therefore the slaves uh, uh, cannot appear as the exploited subjects of labor in the sense of Marx's proletariat. So in certain sense, Marx's theory of value cannot reach the slave labor, as a slave is like a cow in a plow, it has no value. While the worker provides commodities separated from nature, a slave, as Denis Ferreira da Silva argues, on the contrary, becomes nature as fossil. With this analysis of slave lives, I couldn't agree more. This makes Ferreira da Silva's conclusion that Marx, like other previous Western philosophers, uh, sorry, this makes Denis Ferreira da Silva conclude that Marx, like other previous Western philosophers, relies on the already classified distinctions. This is why the total violence of slave labor that took place before those distinctions and judicial contracts is not counted by him. And that is true. From her point of view, Marx's whole politeconomic endeavor in the analysis of value is confined to mechanistic, formal, determinist description of sociality, precisely for the reason that he never heeded 
um, uh, the job and the labor and the type of work that was implemented by the slaves. And again, uh, uh, we could only agree with Da Silva's critique of Marx's limitations in that she discerns the forms of exploitation beyond Marx's theory of value and workers' labor. However, what concerns his technique I wouldn't agree because I would add that while Marx's social analysis might be limited, his thinking technique, his dialectical technique, is not determinate or mathematical. It is dialectical and it surpasses rigid philosophic formalizations, determinacy and distinctions. Marx disputes non-dialectical formalized and positivist application of philosophy. When Marx elaborates the dialectics of the value form, he ascribes it to the alienated capitalist production. So value in that case is not an ontological state, but real political, factual, inevitable condition. The fact that value defines being is rather a vicious factuality for Marx than an existential or ethical basis on which he would like to rely. But the novelty of Marx is in that he started to treat ontic, real political, factual issues, unlike other philosophers, who treated only metaphysical concepts. And Marx conversely showed that the ontics, the factuality of surplus value in capitalist production, can be refurbished or retransformed into the ideal ontological necessity of use value. And it is here that Marx's analysis uh, of value resides. Uh, now I would, move, I would move to the refutation of cogito, which we come across constantly, of course not only in uh, uh, postcolonial and decolonial thought, but in Western philosophy itself. And according to this traditional critique of reason, cogito represents an authoritarian, rationalistic control over nature, body and affects. In uh, the critique of metaphysics, Descartes' cogito is associated with the division into body and mind, as we all remember. And Ferreira da Silva refers to cogito as the exemplary case of precisely that formalization, effectivity and functionality of thought, which when it was colonizing the uh, South, colonizing the African land, was dissecting it according to, to its judicial practice. So um, cogito formed itself geopolitically, geographically into this form of separation and mathematization, which helped to functionalize uh, the South in the colonial project. She writes, yeah, this we already went through. Yeah, and this is my question. Can we apply on the same plane philosophic concepts as they are used in emancipatory utopian ontological realm and uh, the way they are abused in real politics? Uh, and uh, that's her uh, rebuke to, to Cogito. Resting on the two onto epistemological components of affectivity and necessity, Cartesian cogito began, began a trajectory that would extend beyond the confines of knowledge to become the ruler of modern economic, juridical, ethical, and aesthetic scenes. Indeed, Western rationality extended to become such ruler. But was it cogito that was applied in ruling all those scenes? My allegation, and I might be mistaken, of course, and you might uh, come into argument, and I'm expecting your uh, critical comments. My argument is that the notions like that, that are posited philosophically, they don't go into real political uh, application, but not because they are not practical. 
but rather uh, because um, the real political application does not encompass all the possibilities uh, and all the potentialities of that notion. Jacques Derrida, in his Cogito and the History of Madness, argues with Michel Foucault and claims that Cogito reason is not at all rationality. And uh, this is a famous text uh, where, um, which he wrote against Michel Foucault and after which Michel Foucault didn't even talk to uh, Derrida because, as you remember, Michel Foucault was also very critical when he was researching insanity, he was very critical to Cartesian cogito, whereas Derrida's uh, point was that it is reason that is insane. So it is cogito itself which is the utmost realization of insanity. And it, it, if we go how Descartes himself describes... And the ritualization and, and of re cogito. Yeah, and, and how he describes the impossibility to say cogito ergo sum, and I, I will return to it later, why it is insanity. Uh, then we cannot but say that uh, philosophy starts with insanity. And th this was, of course, undermining Foucauldian uh, insistence that there is cogito and there is uh, creative and new shift towards insane practices. So cogito, according to Derrida, should be interpreted in this case not as a jubilating judgment of rational subject, but rather a statement of extreme disability, like a vulnerable subject is asking cogito ergo sum? In fact, cogito is the reason that remained without God, as it discovered itself to be merely a human secularized mind, remaining without its once guaranteed superhuman complements to life. Mythology, faith, mysticism, religion, immortality, eternal life. In this case, the mind that claimed its new agency without God or any other supernatural assistance finds itself in total groundlessness. And it is this groundlessness uh, from which stems um, this, um, this enunciation, actually, which is first and foremost enunciation in its uh, empirical condition. Uh, and we see here rather groundlessness and the doom of mortality, whereas previously all inhuman components had cooperated with humanity in its mystic cosmic home. Uh, but this paradox of vulnerability even goes further if we interpret cogito in this way, exactly because the thinking body relies only on her reason and not on any higher non-human reason. And we know that theocratic societies rely on divine reason and the theocratic condition which guarantees uh, certain uh, realizations of canons. Uh, but this solitary reason which is fallen into groundlessness automatically asserts that reason without God has to be inevitably generic, collective, because one solitary reason is not communicative, it is too helpless. Thinking of a deficient creature presupposes clinging to another human presence and can only function as an interhuman category. So, in short, human creatures have to generalize their existence and dissolve themselves in social bonds that is in the other determined non-self-being. So reasoning without God in the new secular condition means you have to reason with the other and together with the other. And in that sense, reason is not power as it is the accusation from different contexts, not only post-colonial, decolonial, but also Western uh, post-structuralist, but uh, it is an effort of uniting humans out of anthropological deficiency and vulnerability. This is the reason why I was asking this question that maybe all those notions 
that we already went through enlightenment when we deconstructed it and showed from another angle, reason when we deconstructed it and showed from another angle, whether they, in their emancipatory utopian realm, can function for us otherwise, and whether we are following the proper path when we one-sidedly insist on uh, on the necessity to dispense with them. This is why we have to ask the question, as philosophic concepts operate in the two incompatible dimensions, ontic, factual and ontological, epistemic, as I repeat again. <laughs> um, And uh, another uh, example, which is also associated with the stability of unification and universalism, is of course Hegel. Right? We associate Hegel with with this powerful circulation and circulatory development of um, consciousness to reason and then to spirit, etc. That in his speculation, Hegel especially in Phenomenology of Spirit, is radical enough to announce quite a crazy thing, and namely that he will not be using subject-predicate proposition, the model that enables making judgment and deduction, that is, he declined discursive determinate a simple logical structure, for instance, I don't know, the, anim the cat is the animal and the cat eats milk or drinks milk or uh, children go to school, etc. But he insisted that the concept, Begriff, can only be elaborated through the subject-subject speculation. And this meant a revolutionary thing, namely that speculation surpasses determination. So again, there is a mistake. Hegel is not determinate. He goes beyond it. Uh, he's ungraspable by any distinct separation in this dialectical technique. And this technique, we cannot say that A is B, but we say A is A1, which is A2, and maybe A is A3. So subject remains subject. For instance, speculation of that kind would be also a Heideggerian speculation when he says mm, non-being doesn't exist or being is not a non-being. And I give here the quotation from Hegel. It's very good if you uh, 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 look how it looks. Yeah, and here you see that the path is the path of doubt and then it is also the path of despair, and then it's not quite doubt, and then it's the disappearance of doubt, and then it is, in addition, the path uh, of the conscious insight, etc. Uh, and we constantly, when we read Hegel, and if any of you had ever a seminar on Hegel, it's always uh, impossible to remember in the sentence what was said uh, before. And then you, you sh it's very good and very practical to have many people around because someone always remembers what the other one doesn't. Um, uh, now uh, getting to another, yet another uh, concept that we shall um, uh, deconstruct and it is of course the universal, the most vicious one uh, and the most... Um, um, uh, the most colonial one associated with expansion, with unification. So without any intention to dispute the colonial or imperialist angles of universalism, I would nevertheless dwell on the confusions in the interpretation of this concept. It is usually interpreted as unification, as we know, of diverse components uh, operated by one common feature, some abstract mediator or invariant or formal relation. And indeed, the imposition of one unifying invariant that rules all the diversity or multiplicity of phenomena, when we translate this into geopolitical or cultural frames, 
it is undoubtedly restrictive it and definitely um, it defies and neutralizes the particularities and the differences. As uh, Ferreira da Silva offers um, uh, her, in her rendering, uh, she claims the following uh, when she analyzes, critically analyzes the universal, that precisely this notion of affectivity lies at the core of the modern ethical program and accounts for how difference plays into it. For there too, the assignation of value results not from direct comparison, the juxtaposition of two or more things. So not the empirical uh, comparison of two things. Uh, not the practical one, but from the operation of a universal formal mediator, the universal unit of measurement or the universal basis for classification. And it is precisely this classification that forms the European or the Western law, but at the same time uh, defines the measure as the et ethics for the others, the measure which is imposed on certain regions and geographies which are not which should not be subservient or which should not succumb to that logic. And to those measures of efficacy, let's say, and, and effectivization, terms even like, again, the fundamental terms like truth, democracy, and so on, are being Absolutely. applied then further as well, as yeah. they are defined in this universal... As um, emancipatory. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Emancipa emancipatory unit. Exactly. But again, I would like to... Um, somehow juxtapose uh, her statement with Ashil Bembe, which is conversely seeing the universal uh, as common, as the dimension of the common. So not as something which is united as a formal mediator, as in structure, as in system, as in rigid systematicity, but rather as in the act of sharing, because if we share I don't know, a piece of bread or a piece of cheese, uh, then there's also some common uh, denominator, right? Uh, this makes us um, uh, united and common. And um, Mbembe argues that ethnocentrism is a hypostatic variant of the desire of those of African origin to need only to justify themselves to themselves. It is true that such a world is above all a form of relation to oneself. But there is no relation to oneself that does not also implicate the other. So Mbembe also claims the, the common, the universal through other. The other is at once different and united. What we must imagine is a politics of humanity that is fundamentally a politics of the similar, but in a context in which what we all share from the beginning is difference. It is our differences that paradoxically we must share. Indeed, universality can only be pluriversal because when it self-expresses, it addresses the other by definition, right? And therefore, it addresses the generic subject and therefore implies the different selves. Bembe quotes M. S. S. R. saying that while both reject abstract visions of the universal, he and M. S. S. R., uh, they argue that the universal can as well be defined as community of singularities and differences, a sharing that is at once the creation of something common and a form of distinction. And I move on to the treatment of the universal in materialist dialectics that we come across in uh, Marxist philosophy, such as uh, Ewald uh, Ilyenkov's treatment of the universal, which is uh, even more paradoxical. And I used this in my book, Practicing the Book, Practicing the Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ilyenkov's take is that uh, materialist dialectics, and in his materialist dialectics, binding of the two various phenomena is by no means determined by abstract invariant or abstract fixture. For instance, all chairs produced in one firm, 
or all women of the same race or uh, uh, all commodities of the same price. The condition of sharing is provided much sooner by certain trait that one lacks and another possesses. As Ilyenkov writes, the lacked feature ties two things or individuals together much stronger than its equal presence. Thus, along with nominalist and structuralist application of the universal, where we have formal and indifferent unifying of things, there are other modes of commonalization. For example, table and chair. Not all tables will be universal, because I mean only the table is not sufficient to sit at the table. To sit at the table, you need the chair. Therefore, the universal kit will, will, will be table and chair. And the universal kit will not be all brides of the same age, but bride and groom. <laughs> so, um, crucial in this attitude is not a coercive unification, but the other determined non-self, determination with the help of the other, that is positing the other self of oneself, oneself through the other self. Yet another aspect for uh, Ilyenkov's treatment of the universal is the category of um, genetic condition, not identification, but genesis, implying that um, he defines, um, w when he uses this word uh, universal, it's translated into Russian as, uh, not as universalne, but as всеобщие. So, more reminiscent of Hegel's Allgemeine. I would use generic, maybe, generic or general. So, uh, he claims that the, uh, he understands this genetic element, and this was common for all Marxist philosophers, even in Marxist psychology, as I talked uh, the other day uh, about uh, Vygotsky, the, the, the genetic method. Uh, so, he claims that what unites human is not this one feature or one formal denominator, but the fact that we all have common predecessor. Our synchronic uh, community never owns our speech, skills or habits, and there is always somebody, there is always this inheritance or sharing that we inherit from the previous conditions. And this is the reason why culture, in that context, is nothing but universal. And now I will be un unwinding uh, this vicious term that culture is universal as against culture, which is always particular and always uh, multicultural. But the multicultural element of culture doesn't contradict the universality uh, of culture, and I will try to show it. So, concerning the genetic element and the genetic aspect of the universal is that uh, I speak the language, therefore my human capacity of language is universal because everyone speaks the language and everyone before me spoke the language. Uh, the diachronic and genetic dimension means that something that was created or made hundreds of years or millennia ago or thousands of miles away forms us, forms me, and remains important. I'm not culturally connected directly to Peter Bruegel, for instance, but Bruegel touches on what I remember from my childhood or my experience of winter, even though I never lived in Netherlands or never lived in 16th century. And uh, uh, could we use the episode from Tarkovsky's, uh, let's not start yet, I will make a little introduction. I would like to show a very uh, short excerpt from Andrei Tarkovsky's Mirror. When the protagonist remembers himself as a schoolboy who stands in a snow-covered landscape, which brings together the reminiscences of the Second World War and Bruegel the Elder's painting, and the viewer who knows Bruegel immediately grasps the association. But even if one never saw Bruegel and his winter landscapes, this leap from a simple daily natural 
phenomenon and a winter landscape to Bregel resonates because this work might capture the poetic association that anyone might have with the winter landscape. And uh, uh, let's um, uh, quickly watch it. No, could we first uh, come to my presentation, please? So this is this uh, Bruegel's uh, landscape, uh, the hunters in the snow, and I will be showing another uh, association, another cultural association, genetic and universal, which is Rembrandt's prodigal son. And now we can uh, uh, switch the mirror. And it will have no sounds, right? Ah, it has. Yeah, we can stop here. And you see, uh, uh, this bird is on the landscape as well, but it doesn't sit on anyone's head. It simply <laughs> is perched somewhere. And let's uh, sh see the, the last um, uh, 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 the last uh, part of Salaris, Endic of Salaris. No, no, further, further, further. Yes, here, here. No, even further, a little bit further. Yeah, okay. And he sees his father, and as you remember, this is the end of the film when it is the materialized planet that materializes your beloved people from the past.
We can stop here. Uh, uh, this cultural association in both cases uh, for Tarkovsky, uh, not only for Tarkovsky, as arrests the chronic time. Therefore, it is something else than merely aesthetic association. It is rather about an existential presence in the world due to genetic and transhistoric entanglement with the experience of many others, the experience that took place before my life, will happen after my life, in the life of many others, or beyond my loca location. Hence the universality of culture. This is an explicit example of cultural association if we allege that nothing in the Western art can be seen apart from colonial conquest and its oblique manifestation in culture as the history of colon colonization. Then this glimpse of Bruegel as the Western artist can be interpreted as an inevitable influence of hegemonic Western culture on the origin of Tarkovsky. So it is a Western hegemonic influence, right, on the one hand. But we as spectators can tell that this borrowing of Dutch painting or stealing of Dutch painting by the Soviet director is not about conquest of non-European consciousness by the European one, but rather about the truthfulness of the event that a work of art or cultural fact might bear in itself regardless of its geography. And all the above mentioned notions which we already went through are ontologically functional and emancipatory only when they surpass geography. Therefore my question is, should we spare for culture, thought or art the room which preserves their emancipatory autonomy, even if they emerged in a colonizing state. Maybe in culture and thought there is a dimension which following moves distinction into ontics and ontology cannot be instrumentalized in real politics ontically and can keep its non-selfish potentiality ontologically. Edouard Glissant, a Caribbean French anti-colonial thinker and a poet, in his Poetics of Relation poses precisely this question when he suggests that the opacity of another culture or of the other is not an obstacle for creating a relation and fabric out of this difference. In this case, togetherness does not contradict distinction. To feel in solidarity with the other, or to build with him, or to like what he does, it's not necessary for me to grasp that other, nor to make him in my image. Meanwhile, opacity is not enclosure within an impenetrable autarchy, but subsistence within an irreducible singularity. The right to opacity would not establish autism. It would be the real foundation of relation in freedoms, continues Glissant. And now I move to principal and most important uh, part uh, where I will be wrapping up gradually. Um, to Vladimir Bibler's logic of culture, which has the uh, aspects of Glissant in himself, but which in certain sense goes even further and claims that culture in its episteme and inception is a dialogue, but not simply in terms of communication of cultures, but already on the level of sentence that articulates culture and I will explain how it functions. It cannot profess any authentic identity by definition. We say culture when we claim representation of our habits, artifacts. This is our normal use. Uh, but um, uh, Bibler uses culture otherwise. The dialogue with the other is inevitable, as I have no identity even with myself, and even with myself, I am in dialogue as a non-identical other. That is why each culture can only realize itself when it reaches its own verge, the border of going out of itself. 
So this necessity of culture to live itself and to fall in love with another culture, to borrow from another culture, or to expect that someone borrows from you is very natural. As Bibler claims, if we look at the logic of connection of the cultural phenomena, what is important in it is that facts belonging to different periods or places communicate with each other in simultaneity. This is incredible in culture that it is diachronic and it, it connects things that are totally cast away from each other in geography and in time, all of a sudden come together in this act of love when the face of um, face painted by Leonardo da Vinci is compared by Tarkovsky to his mother's face. When Dante communicates with Firdousi, when Hegel communicates with Homer, when Sayatnova for Parajanov uh, communicates with uh, Rustavelli, when Tarkovsky communicates with Bruegel. And such culture, of course, exceeds uh, ethnography and geography. This dialogue is not a regular interlocution. So culture is itself has the form, has the prosodic and propositional form of interlocution. But it is run not between contemporaries merely, but with a potential interlocutor in such a way that she should be able to perceive me and my work after I die, when I disappear from my potential horizon, when I pass away, when I go to another polis or country, so that she, the potential interlocutor, would perceive me as if from another infinitely distant world. And this is why Bibler, and this is incredibly beautiful, calls that all cultures are tragic because they already impose and imply in themselves this potential death of, of myself and that some will be reading me and um, knowing about me after my uh, extinction. So um, potentially it means that I speak after my death, I might need to speak with the other of other times and places from another time, century, landscape, language. And uh, I like this quotation very much where he says that every culture is a source cry to another culture, presupposing that this interlocutor is more urgent to me than my own life. And indeed, you know, uh, for instance, um, uh, the poets of Languedoc in France, they were more obsessed with Arabic poetry with, but than with their poetry. And if they, they did not learn Arabic poetry, they wouldn't be able to intensify the Languedoc uh, tradition of amor to that extent. And the sa same happens in Georgian poetry, which reaches its renaissance due to Arabic translation modernization project of the 9th, 11th centuries. Uh, and um, uh, just to mention Groys's uh, idea from his recent uh, text, Um, Groys claims that writers and artists followed this path of becoming other to one's origin and self too often. If these authors want to be historically relevant, they leave their cultural milieus behind, often in the form of emigration. In this way, writers and artists obtain the freedom to create new identities that are not natural but artificial. And another strong allegation Working class, as Groys continues, is one such artificially constructed new counter-identity in the attempt of creating collective otherness in relation to all previous natural states. Um, and I want to return uh, uh, by finishing, and when I'm finishing, again to Hegel's treatment and organization of the grief, of the notion. 
because uh, we shall deal with this necessity of interlocutor, right? So we decided that to think about culture, to posit culture, it's not enough and sufficient to have cultural artifacts, to accumulate them, to organize a, a museum, uh, and then state that this is our legacy. No, it's very important to keep the mental procedure of this interlocution, of this internal dialogue. And it is precisely this internal dialogue which was posited by uh, uh, Vygotsky as internal speech. Uh, when he claims that internal speech is not simply a logical operation, but it's the birth of thinking. Uh, and uh, Bibler is connecting here the cultural dialogue, the prosody of culture as such, uniting these two capacities and opportunities. Hegel's um, insistence that we should speak as crazy people, subject, subject, and Vygotsky's uh, obligation and necessity that thinking starts with the internalization of social phenomena. And without this internalization of social phenomena, culture cannot uh, generate. So not necessarily that I have certain cultural facts, but I have to internalize them in my speculative uh, capacity. So the structural form of such speculative sentences, as we mentioned, does not form itself as subject predicate, but subject subject. Thus, according to Bibler, culture crystallizes with this interiorized speculation of outward so sociality. Such condition proves that culture is not merely a set of artifacts. It is as well a mode of thinking without which neither thought nor the ideal dimension of social production would be possible. Internal speech becomes for Bibler and Vygotsky the launching point of culture because in this internalization oh sorry in this internalization of the social phenomena the speech develops a special logical capacity to tune social phenomena as the geist events, something that, you know, very old-fashioned Soviets looked like duchovnost. This is what I came to, sorry. So social phenomena form themselves uh, as geist events, elevating them to spiritual existentiality. And you see this in Tarkovsky, but as well as Bibler uh, insists this is necessary as the prosody of culture. Thank you so much, Kerry, for this very thick <laughs> narrative uh, and for um, a lot of flows of thinking that you presented to us. I'm sure uh, all our brains are hurting <laughs> at the moment from the multiplicity of questions that actually Kerry brought up in. And I have, I don't know, five pages of notes <laughs> myself. But before I'll jump in, maybe some of you want to first uh, address a question regarding to one of the notions that Kerry brought in as problematics. Um, uh, or to one of the questions that Kerry um, posed in the lecture. Okay, I'll start then. <laughs> uh, I very much enjoyed uh, the uh, red thread that you presented in the lecture that actually breaks the uh, boundary um, between the uh, understanding of modernity, modernism, and modernization as a continuous as, and the logical sets of the words that uh, more or less describe the same procedure, but rather shows actually antagonistic narratives in between of them, especially the notion of anti-modern modernization is very interesting and there you touched a little bit on the avant-garde in that sense but I just was uh, thinking if you could elaborate a bit more with examples I think it's a very interesting context in there especially in relation to such 
avant-garde and modernizing supposedly practices as uh, the birth of the contemporary art uh, practitioners and the birth of contemporary art prophets, in a way, who were sort of used the magic, in a way, as a turning into the contemporary artwork, the urinal, or uh, returning to uh, conversion of something that does not have presence in the realm of the fine art. And I think you very nicely returned to it in the last question. Uh, so in that particular um, uh, breakthrough in general, I wonder if that, if this particular moment in history, the uh, um, uh, people say the birth of the avant-garde is the the very thick red line that highlights that mm. differentiation, or we have other sort of cyclical processes of that happening before, even in those return moments to the uh, uh, to the um, uh, in reading, for example, uh, the uh, of the Arabic poetry. By, uh, by the medieval French troubadours in general, trying to understand that. So whether it's cyclical processes, basically, or whether it's something that's rather more phenomena, f phenomenal and unique. Thanks. Uh, uh, well, um, I, I would rather think that I understand modernism and generally this idea of modernity as catalogically. And I would like to think it as catalogically because it was hinging on revolution and uh, hinging on revolutions and the failed revolutions. And of course, modernity is the still functioning hope of the revolution and overall socializing emancipation, whereas modernism, uh, modernization is simply simplification and technocratization of this idea of modernity and instrumentalized a shift of it in uh, crafts and uh, industries, uh, whereas modernism is uh, a very important uh, also eschatological turn of despair, of despair which is um, um, annihilating that bond with the world that functioned before and somehow creating this hermetic zone of uh, emptiness and nothingness to revenge the world for its own utilitarian, uh, um, commercialized, um, um, I don't know, um, commercialized choice. Uh, anyone in the audience would like to step in? Maria. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Katie. This was. Um, it was interesting to hear the developments of where, where uh, your next project uh, is going. Um, my question is uh, maybe different to what, what has been discussed now with respect to art, uh, but going back to, uh, to theory, I was thinking, um, I don't know whether you would agree, uh, maybe I misunderstood um, your intention at the beginning to juxtapose the decolonial, post-colonial to uh, critical theory and philosophy, Western philosophy, um, because I don't see such a gap in, um, in what you have said and in the theories you uh, discussed. For instance, uh, what Adorno uh, claims in the Dialectics of Enlightenment is similar, the constructive gesture with his attempt to understand fascism, uh, right, that, that the book is precisely written uh, for, for, for that, to uh, analyze uh, the rationality of capitalism and to discover this basis uh, of uh, ne negative kind of um, residual of the rational in, 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 in philosophical rationalism and in all the kind of discourse and to link it with the development of capitalism. So I don't see then a contradiction with what then theoretically um, as a, I mean, I haven't read the Silva in details, but from your treatment of of, of what the, exposi the exposition of this theory, I don't see uh, that the gesture methodologically and politically is radically actually different from what Adorno had to discover in the very uh, essence of uh, modernity and, and, and enlightenment. Um, 
so I mean, uh, why then? W w what is this supposition? Uh, who is this decolonial? <laughs> is it cultural industry or is it a specific uh, generic term uh, for some developments uh, in I don't know in art, or is it um, because if you look at this particular text, uh, I I don't think you you can find this uh, a very harsh opposition, including in member and in others, which actually the basis of many of these theories is post-structural deconstruction and logically, uh, at least in post-colonial theory, in decolonial theory is actually quite different, I would say, but some of it is also based on the same premise. So, but in post-colonial theory, it, it, it is the same argument to critically read philosophical traditions and to uh, recover epistemically, uh, to focus on epistemologies, right, to recover traces of some symptoms in uh, society, in uh, contemporary uh, life, and, and, and so on and so forth. And very briefly, the second point I wanted to ask is with respect to Vygotsky and his notion of inter internalization of, of the speech which um, I also am unsure whether this is what he identifies as the birth of thinking, because as far as I am aware, uh, I think Vygotsky thinks that, the, that, that he's not coming to any kind of basic metaphysical beginning of thought, uh, that, that this is not how he constructs his theory, but he rather assumes that indeed, as you uh, emphasized, uh, the thought begins generically on a social level, right? It, it is already given. We don't have to discover any origin. There is no origin of it. It's just giving uh, in human community. But internalization of thinking is just individual use uh, and individualization of, of that form. And thinking can be also nonverbal. Uh, therefore, his interest to uh, different kinds of disabilities, which uh, proves that a thought is not lo lo it's not logos is not necessarily linked to actually speech, but that just uh, if if you can clarify uh, yes. that, and I don't know whether you agree with with Adorno and others, um, but I I think that would be important to just. Um, perhaps clarify, because I think this art practices is something one, but all these theories and diversity of, of these theories is uh, maybe something else, but thank you. Thanks a lot. A really important question, actually. I uh, very much take it uh, as uh, an important continuation uh, actually, I did not mean to make any juxtaposition between Western and non-Western. On the contrary, uh, I was searching for those theories which would not be uh, juxtaposing, but nevertheless, some uh, still are. So for me, uh, theories of Fanon, of MSSR, of Edouard Glissant, are uh, in the group of uh, what I read uh, in uh, uh, Adorno and in post-structuralist authors. Um, and especially uh, for me is really important uh, this seminal book by Achille Mbembe. Uh, and I was amazed to see how many intersections there are uh, with, uh, for instance, um, Virno uh, or Ilyenkov. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, as for Da Silva, she has a fantastic ruminations and speculations about negativity, negativity of the black body, and in that sense, uh, she truly goes into uh, into philosophic analysis. Uh, uh, this is absolute. Uh, the only thing. Uh, that I disagree with is uh, mm, very flat uh, interpretation of uh, uh, 
cl the so-called classical philosophic techniques. And this, this was the only point. So otherwise, for me, this juxtaposition uh, is not important, but it becomes important when we deal with the more or less popular application of uh, popular or cultural or art application of uh, decolonial theory, which somehow simplifies those issues and makes those juxtaposition too evident. So I was a little bit uh, arguing against those uh, artificial and non-functional simplifications. As for Vygotsky, I totally agree that he doesn't deal with any uh, metaphysical issue and the speech, the internal speech is not speech as such, it is organized not as speech at all and has a very specific organization of its own and its own prosody and uh, uh, semantics and uh, syntax. Uh, but what was important for me uh, is that he himself in this book on the development of higher mental functions several times uh, claims that this level of birth of thought is at the same cultural. And I was wondering why, I mean, why he would call it cultural? Uh, does the child learn something from culture? And then I com came across the explanation with Vladimir Bibler, who compares this type of prosody and proposition uh, to the dialogical structure and shows its organization precisely as the, as the abnormal speech, as the speech which is not the written speech. And therefore, um, uh, this uh, idea when I said that um, social phenomena become geist, it's not becoming a religious phenomenon or it's not becoming geist, uh, sp spirited in terms of uh, some metaphysics. Uh, but it is becoming uh, simply a cultural phenomenon, a, a cultural necessity. And what is culture in that sense? It is the necessity of the non-utilitarian, that's it. First. Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, I think my question very much kind of follows on from Masha's um, question that, and you invited the audience to disagree, so I'll run with your invitation. I think that you, um, you don't need the beginning to come to the conclusion of your talk. And the question I have then is kind of um, why do you want to um, rehabilitate cogito, um, you know, and uh, argue that philosophical concepts have no inherent politics? You know, there are m multiple people who disagree with that and would say, I don't know, Deleuze would say every concept. Uh, philosophical concepts, I didn't hear. Don't have any uh, politics. It's only in the use or application. Like the, the, the way you set out the project in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, removes politics from philosophical concepts, which a lot of people worked to, to connect and to say the co concepts create their own worlds. They, they are political for immediately from, from the way they are made. And so, for instance, Deleuze has this one-page article um, saying that some concepts cannot be saved. They serve their function, they are too heavy with um, their use, and it's, it's not worth saving them, trying to overthrow, to show the wrong use or something, because you can never fight this kind of histories, multiple histories. So the cogito made its way into economics, for instance, where we are, which we're now facing as our environment with rational choice theory, you know. And so it's like, um, the, so yes, my question is, I guess, whether it's worth fight, you know, um, trying to save concepts that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it seems to be like you set out to do in the beginning, or you can actually activate other concepts to argue what you argue then later on. Mm. Thanks, Olga. This is a great question, actually. I myself was thinking about it, mm, and um, I think that in case of Cogito, yes, it, it makes sense, 
But I didn't, uh, probably I have to uh, rephrase certain arguments uh, because um, maybe some of you had this impression that I speak about some philosophic application, which is some ontological proper application, and then there is this uh, a real political application. No, uh, I, I meant that mm, uh, there is the application of the notion when it is not instrumentalized, when it is... Uh, when, it, when it still has the broader application to different functions, when it is multifunctional, not one functional, like universal is the occupation of the place and universalizing and exterminating all differences and nothing else. Uh, uh, so I was uh, against those instrumental and one-sided interpretation claiming that the philosophy is precisely more political because philosophy uh, philosophic application leaves us the freedom to apply it further, to apply it to different places, and even gives us more opportunities to apply it, rather than have an already interpreted condition when it is uh, discarded or dismissed, this notion. So I agree that there are notions that are not necessary, but about cogito I would uh, really have doubts that we have to defy it or to refute it, yes. Although Deleuze, for instance, he's, he thought that consciousness should be totally dismissed. Yeah, but, but yeah, others thought otherwise. Yeah, and the politicality and plurality here, the difference is also pretty, yes, pretty interesting in the subject. Yeah. That's exactly where the politicality of philosophy yes. is an interesting agenda and the Chantal the move Politicality and the political. Yeah, yeah. That's where the move also comes in very nicely. I make it short. Um, yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed your, your talk, Hetty. And, and I was wondering, so I think one way to, to or one thing to take from it for me is almost this kind of gesture of reclaiming universalism or reclaiming the enlightenment. And I think there are also different ways of doing this. I mean, one example would be David Graeber's way of saying it's not even Western, it's coming off of Madagascar. This would be another kind of idea of reclaiming yeah. universalism. And I um, was curious about your specific gesture and also the Soviet idea of Soviet universalism. And, and what I was interested in is if we understand universalism not as a uh, mere expression of Western domination or a, a colonial hegemony, but in itself universal. So you say universalism is universal. It's not even Western. And then I was curious um, whether there are multiple universalisms and what is the specificity of the Soviet universalism, which nowadays is often of is accused of just being Russian imperialism under a new guise or it's... A, so I would c be curious, what is the kind of, what are your ideas about these kind of questions? Yeah, thanks a lot. I don't think there is any Soviet universalism or Russian universalism or, I don't believe in this. I don't believe in this interpretation which is geographically tied to the place and um, uh, uh, th there are different notions uh, like strategic universalism, uh, uh, differentiating universalism, but uh, I would say that uh, the question is not in the ism, uh, but the question in universalization is uh, that whereas you have just because and by the token, by the token of having particular, you might as well have something that sh that is shared between them. So it's even a logical operation. For me, it's a logical operation. It's like not claiming the universal is like you are not going on with the logical operation. It's like eating cheese and not eating bread. Uh, and then universal will be leveling, and it's a practical category of how to how to level level it and how to balance it, rather than uh, establishing it I as th as the value. So, in certain sense, uh, yes, I, I agree that Ilyenkov's positing of the universal is really unique and is really wonderful. But uh, you can see that in Hegel too. Without Hegel, this would not be possible. So I wouldn't say that this is Soviet 
uh, universalism and uh, uh, it is totally torn from some else. Of course, there are the schools, there are the philosophic schools, definitely, and certain uh, features of them. But uh, I now tend to delink uh, certain events from the necessity of, of their geography. Hi, um, thank you so much, Katy. Thank you. Um, I have a, a well question, also, which is also built up on well, Isa's question here and Maria's question as well about universals as well. Um, and um, I really liked you. You had a quotation of um, Bembe, um, which was talking about the fact that um, what we this like understanding of universality is based on differences so it is differences that we share um which was which you then link to Ilyenkov and uh this idea of uh or or, or, or the generic uh, or genetic or, ge or the general and i was wondering how to link this with commons and more or less contemporary dis discourse on the commons or and 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 um, um yeah like um because on the one hand, we have universal or the concept of the universal. On the other hand, we have the concept of general. And then we have um, today commons, which in a way, in today's discourse, in feminist, uh, for example, theories, and also in some of the decolonial theories, and uh, are used I as a something different, maybe, or they, they claim that, it's it, uh, that it is used a bit differently, maybe, from universals. I'm not sure, maybe. And um, yeah, this is what I thought of, because also, um, I think what was very, I mean, what was very interesting for me is when you said, uh, or maybe in your talk you highlighted somehow, I'm not sure whether you said it or not, that what is universal, maybe wha how we can understand this universal, like saving the universal uh, the still, is this capacity of, so, so the ca capacity to share, right? And that is very interesting. Um, and that also reminded me all this, yeah, like the discourse on commons, but also maybe of some of the feminist or eco-feminist discourses of, of the commons, uh, which again are, could be maybe described, I'm wondering if you, what you would say about this, as affirmative rather than negative, for example. And then maybe I was thinking whether I could link this to the ending of your talk of like distinction between critical theory on the one hand, and then on the other hand, something which is what like s something like the call you mentioned like some of the theories but i was wondering if what you distinct what is distinguished from critical theory is theories or the practices that are affirmative because you did mention that like that they are affirmative rather than negative to modernity so if modernity and the even like counter modernity is if counter modernity is um characterized by this negativity to modernity something different, for example, in decolonial theories, would be then affirmative, and that would be difference but between them and this critical theory or, or like counter-modernity. And I was wondering if commons or the idea of commons uh, can, can help us here, because, for example, eco-feminist authors who talk about this affirmativity and also commons also talk about situated universals, but not as like the, yeah, I don't know, now I'm just um, going on for forever, but I don't know how, how much you got from this, but... Uh, just thoughts. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, really important. Uh, well, just uh, referring back to Isa's question about um, uh, concrete uh, features of Soviet uh, universalism, I would say that uh, something that Ilyenkov has uh, invented is gravity. So he universalizes things out of gravity. And this is something that I uh, only came across maybe a little bit in Hegel. So the lack that you somehow replenish in the other. Uh, and this would be probably the, the main feature of, of this kind of universalism. As for, uh, as for the commons, I mean, there, there is a very simple distinction of uh, Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft. And it immediately brings you what is community, what are the commons which are always confined to community, and certain kind of community-based uh, hermetic uh, 
um, closed structure and the Gesellschaft, uh, which is an open construct, and it does not require that people are close and the people are very somehow um, in any way closely connected. So uh, I would say that um, uh, uh, the universal is in no way um, only concrete body collectivity. It is as, as well the principle uh, that would uh, bring things into common. For instance, the necessity of common good for everyone. Or, uh, again, certain denominator... No, 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 denominator is not uh, correct. Certain experience that would be shared by everyone, for instance, for Ilyenkov and for uh, Soviet psychologists, this was activity or labor. Um, uh, or for some else would be language. So in certain sense, you are uniting through certain practice uh, that is common and not necessarily uh, through certain choice and by definition of paying money and becoming part of this lobby. Uh, so in that sense, it's not only body presence, but also the principle that would be shared. We have maybe time for last very short question. Uh, do you have? Did you have a question? Okay, just a brief one. Okay, brief. I really like your argument, but I don't think you're best served by your citations. Um, oh, um, brides aren't to grooms as tables are to chairs these days. Brides have brides, yeah. And um, sure, but yeah. They can be also yeah, okay. And the, the other one is, uh, more seriously, I think, is Frere de Silva's comment, as I construed it from your citation, about Marx neglecting slavery, does miss the, the, the section on, on the slave mode of production in, in, the, in the first book of Capital. It would be a more interesting question ethically if the point is the designation of the enslaved person as constant capital because there's a presumption that they can't work harder and therefore become variable capital in the way. And then, but for me, what that did was take me sideways and away from your argument, uh, which I like very much. So thank you very much. Uh, a really a great argument uh, uh, as uh, sl slave subjugation is the constant capital. Yeah, but uh, I have to think about it. Many things, many things. Thank you very much for being with us and the bar is open. It's a great opportunity to continue the conversation with uh, something warming and opening up <laughs> into broader context. Yes, and tomorrow, some of you uh, will be tomorrow with us at the workshop. So we'll start at the same time at 6 p.m. here. Uh, and looking forward to delve into these subjects deeper with examples from the music, contemporary arts and many other uh, media. Thank you.